Hello there, you've joined me for a quite chill, experimental video that I've wanted to make for quite a long time. I want to film the inner workings of my watch, but real slow and real close. Recently, Lauer, the company that makes the Pro Blends that I use all the time, reached out and said, would you like us to send you our Oregon microscope lens kit? And in reply, I said, joke's on you. I already bought it about a year ago. So then they said, what if we sent you some of our new sword macro lenses? And I said, thank you very much, would love some. So this video contains free product, these, not this. I'm gonna be using some of this kit plus a probe to get some lovely, extremely close slow-mo shots of my watch. So I'm just gonna experiment with various lens and camera combinations. I'm gonna start on the 4K Phantom, which is this one, and I'm gonna put it on the bolt just for more precise control. I think I will need to move onto the TMX camera, not for its speed this time, but just because its base ISO is like 12,000, whereas this I run at 1,000, so much more sensitive to light. I'm gonna start on the Sword 60mm macro. The Sword set are full frame cine macro lenses, so importantly they have the PL mount that my Phantoms use, and geared rings so I can use motors on the focus. Throughout this video, just so it's easier for you to see what I'm seeing, I'm going to capture my live feed from the Phantom with the Atomos Sumo monitor. The watch I want to film is this Omega Speedmaster Dark Side of the Moon Apollo 8. It's a ceramic watch, but my favorite thing about it is that it has an open case back and it's a manual watch, so there's no automatic winding rotor that blocks half the movement. I have absolutely no experience opening up a watch like this, despite watching quite a lot of wristwatch revival videos. So I'm going to be filming entirely through the sapphire, but thankfully it's not scratched at all. And if I position the lights correctly, we won't be dealing with any reflections while we're on these lenses of ridiculous magnification. I really enjoy filming quite small mechanical objects on macro lenses. I just think it looks so cool, like in this how a film camera works video. So why don't we slow this down and get in there? At the top of the watch, you can see the balance wheel spinning and stopping, spinning back the other way and stopping. This is each beat of the watch. There are 21,600 beats per hour on this watch, which means the balance wheel moves and stops six times every second. The sword lens allows for these really crisp focus pulls to macro, but because of how close it can go, the width of the lens starts to cast shadows. I'm gonna see if I can eliminate some of these lens shadowing issues with the probe lens because it's got a much smaller end. And the ProTube lens that I've had for many years is a two times magnification. I'm taking measurements here of the camera and the lens and entering it into the robot software. So when I pan or tilt the robot, its nodal point will be right at the lens, as opposed to pivoting at the camera and having the lens act like a baseball bat. This control here is how quickly the robot kind of browses around on my inputs. And uh, I've got it all the way down to creep, which is important so I don't, you know, misclick or sneeze the lens through the back of the watch. The first area of the watch I want to look at is the escape wheel. It's very sunken down, but we can see it. So the first thing I want to do, I'm only at 25, so I need to up the speed. So I'm going to open up the aperture on this probe and set the frame rate to 1000. Here at 1000, you can see that the escape wheel is actually starting and stopping very abruptly. And if I just brighten it up a little bit, you can see that the pallet fork and its jewels are catching each arm of the wheel like a ratchet. And the other area that I want to look at when we get the microscope on is where these wheels interact. This wheel on the right here seems to be directly connected to a wheel above it which we can't see and that wheel looks like it's driving the seconds hand on the face of the watch. Macro lenses will often ditch their markings in feet or meters as they get towards their close focus and then just start using ratios. For example, one to one is when the subject is projected at the exact same size as it is in real life on the sensor. And then beyond that, you have other ratios, say two to one, where the subject is now projected twice as big on the sensor as it actually exists in real life. The Oregon set goes a lot further. It features this main microscope optic here, which goes on the end of these various different tubes. And you've got 10 times, 20 times, 35 and 50 times magnification. And the PL mount is on this end. So it attaches to the camera here. And then this piece goes underneath that. 10 times barrel here. Significant jump from two. This goes on the end like there. And then we have a microscope on the end of a phantom, which is something I've never done before. 
no matter which extension tube from the lens kit you use, the working distance is always about two centimeters. So although the magnification is much higher, you're not physically any closer to the subject. Now I'm just gonna pick an arbitrary place to look at with 10 times magnification. This level of magnification really lets you appreciate the engineering precision they've mastered to get these tiny watch movement pieces so uniform. The second thing I'm noticing is just how massive everything looks. It looks so deep because my focus is so shallow. I'm trying to see through the balance wheel here into the escape wheel, but it's just way too dark on this camera and I'm only at 500. I'm gonna need to go much faster. For context, the area of the watch I'm looking into right now is around here. And you can see that the moving parts are still pretty fast at 500, so I definitely need to be above 1,000 frames a second. Just for context before I switch the camera, I thought it'd be cool to see what 10 times magnification gets you on the dial of the watch. And it's a frame this size. <laughs> the surface of this dial, I believe, is laser etched to look like different parts of the surface of the moon, which is why it looks so lumpy and uneven. Okay, what am I looking at? TMX is on, mounted from the bottom. This camera gives a much brighter image, but as you can see, the sensor is not as pristine and clear as the 4K camera. And I'm just gonna drive all the way back over to the escape wheel where we were looking before. And thankfully, now we can see it. And I'm actually at, all the way in here, I'm at a thousand frames a second. So I'll do a little black reference and just roll a few seconds on that and see what it looks like. So here we are at a thousand frames a second, 40 times slower, looking at the right side of the pallet fork. Could even do a little camera move while we're here, couldn't I? So you can see that as the pallet fork jewel releases the wheel, it moves only a small amount over, and that's because it's actually being recaptured on the left side of the pallet fork. This releases power into the rest of the watch through the balance wheel in very precise, controlled bursts. This type of escapement is known as a Swiss lever. And this ratcheting motion constantly being caught and stopped by the pallet fork is the ticking sound you can hear when you put your ear to the watch. So from what I've read, as the balance wheel reaches the middle of its spin, it knocks the pallet fork off the escape wheel on one side to be re-caught on the other side but it's given a boost of energy because of the shape of the jewel. Watch on the right side here, if I slow it down, you can see that the escape wheel slides along the angled surface of the jewel, which shoves it up, which causes it to be recaptured immediately on the other side. And this is where they sit in relation to each other. Underneath the balance wheel around here is where the wheel will dislodge the fork from that current position six times per second. It's crazy how precisely this lands every time to the point where it looks like the same piece, but it's, there's different levels of wear on each one. I just can't get over how big and fast everything looks through this lens. So we're now going to take a look at where some of that energy ends up in these wheels. Oh yeah, look at this. So I could potentially... Oh, is that a marking? I'm starting to see some stuff that I've never seen on this. So we're at 10 times magnification here, I think. I do want to try going even closer. Maybe just, what is that? <laughs> I don't know if it's like a bunch of schmutz in the cogs or whether there's secret markings. Yeah, what is that thing? It's like a piece of, it's like a Nat's popcorn. Okay, let's have a look at that. Whoa. It appears as though the wheel on the right, which sits directly under the second hand, stops dead on every beat. But this more sawtooth looking wheel on the left seems to be pretty free spinning. If you're wondering why sometimes the, it looks like the footage is slowly jostling around, it's just because the robot is on and on a microscopic level, it's constantly moving. When you're zoomed out, you never see it. It looks like it's rock solid. I just want to show what this magnification looks like on an actual unit of measurement. So by the looks of it there, our frame is about two millimeters wide, according to our tape measure. And the 50 times is a lot longer than the 10 times, so I'm just gonna plop it there for now. Jumping from 10 to 50 might be just completely insane. Might be too much. It might be too, too close and too dark. 
but let's give it a go. God. So we're really gonna start seeing some of the sensor noise here because it is very underexposed. Everything is so massive and dark and I'm only a hundred frames a second just so I can see something. Ah, here we are. This is the area of impact. <laughs> it's absolutely unreal how close that is. Only a hundred frames now. So at 100 frames a second, it's not nearly fast enough to see any extra detail here. It almost just looks like we're watching it in real time. So I'll try a thousand. It's immensely difficult to light. I'm just gonna have to rely on just insane reflective highlights. I'm gonna turn on the uh, incredibly ugly but bright light, see if we can get something. Doing it only for a few seconds at a time so I don't cook the watch. So for context, our 10 times to 50 times looks like this. Oh, it's an insane amount of bounce. <laughs> it's just mad because it looks so precise when you're looking at it with your eye. It's just like perfect. You just see like freeze frames. This close and this slow, it's like duh, 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 duh. <laughs> like a doorstop. I wonder how long each one of these ticks actually lasts. About eight thousandths of a second. For reference, 50 times magnification on the old tape measure. Pretty much fills the frame with one of the millimeter markers. Now don't confuse that for a millimeter, that's just the marker for the millimeter. You'll see that the entire frame fits between two of the millimeter markers. So we're sub mil at this point. Okay, I'm gonna go back to 10 times. I'm gonna to attempt to get this part a little bit slower. Come as wide as possible there, which is really gonna cut down on my sharpness, but I might be able to get a good 10,000. Woo, doable. See, it starts to look quite smeary because I'm, it's so shallow. Let's roll a little bit of that at 10,000. <laughs> is that? piece again. 10,000 frames a second, 10 times magnification. This is, oh, there's, there's vibration. It's not stopping dead, the right wheel. I'm gonna wind it back. It actually looks as though it's vibrating. If I zoom in. Yeah, it stops and vibrates. And that's, that seems to be what kicks the free wheel back. It's a lot more stuttery than it looked at the lower frame rates. Look at this. That's absolutely insane. Look at that vibration. If you just saw this footage alone, it'd be so hard to believe that this is a, like a sub centimeter tiny wheel in a watch. I'm gonna switch back to the probe now and see if I can see what happens when I activate the chronograph. So I'm gonna try and start it, stop it, and reset it all in the same shot. Okay, and start. Stop, reset. Whoa, that's a fast snap. So it seems as though shoving in that pusher builds up an amount of pressure in that mechanism, which causes a pretty violent snap. And it shoves that free spinning wheel that we saw before into the stopwatch wheel, the chronograph wheel in the center. So this is now controlling the big yellow second hand on the front of the watch. I'm now pushing the same pusher in again to stop it. 
equally violent in reverse, slamming back to its original position, and it remains connected to the other wheel at all times. The reset pops the centre wheel loose, and it will take the shortest path back to 12 o'clock. Back to 10 times magnification now to get that same action, but much closer. I don't think I ever would have guessed this is how it starts the chronograph hand. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to push it without jogging the entire thing out of focus there. Okay, I'm going to have to set the focus further down because I can't press that without pushing it. <laughs> okay, the weight of my other hand pushes it more out of focus. You think I'm kicking the bejesus out of this, but I'm just... Okay, this isn't working. Even more. Whew. Might have been it. Fast. It looks so violent slowed down, it almost like wrenches the wheel that it's attached to. It's a genuine motion blur there. That's a 50 microsecond exposure. We're so close that there's actually motion blur. And now once again, resetting the hand at 10 times magnification. Well, there we have it. I hope you enjoyed that footage. I love using this combination of technology to bring out these invisible moments on a bunch of stuff that's right in front of our eyes. If you're interested in getting your hands on any of the Lauer lenses that I used in this video, there is an affiliate link in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.